All right, we are live on YouTube. Welcome, everybody. We are going to do a deep dive into ancient Chinese uh, and Taoist history uh, and learn a little bit about Magu, the hemp goddess. That's me, Peter. And I am joined by Future Cannabis Project art correspondent, <laughs> Mia. <laughs> Welcome, Mia. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and, and in a week or two, she's going to be our uh, our uh, concentrate correspondent. <laughs> Love those dabs. I have a fat dab loaded for the end of this talk, but I need it's my reward. It's my motivation for getting all the facts right. I want to apologize now if I mispronounce anything. I'll be doing art at speed <laughs> and also not all the primary sources i found had pinion with the appropriate tone so i just want to say that now i'm sorry if i mispronounce anything <laughs> yeah you you probably uh speak chinese better than anybody watching so <laughs> i don't see the video popping up on the channel am i on the right screen? uh let me whoops let's check it out Yep, I see lots of people. You, can you guys all see us and hear us? So if you just go to youtube.com slash future cannabis project, and then, uh, and then you should, you see all the videos. Yep. And then you don't see anything that says there's like a light here. I'll get the, uh, hold on everyone. It's, a, it's okay, you could just tell me what's happening in the chat, although I would like to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it'd be awesome if you could kind of respond to people. So let me just give you the direct link okay, to cool. the actual video. I'll be have, patient, uh, everyone. So, so yeah, where are people- for, uh, Thanks for hanging out. <laughs> where are people tuning in from while we're waiting? Um, all right, let me send you. Okay, do you see the little chat window? Did you, oh, can you send it to me on email instead of, instead of, uh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Cheers, because I'm, I'm talking on my computer. My camera on my phone is way better than the janky old webcam I have on my computer. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, thought it would be better if we're talking about visual lights to be in HD. Um, <laughs> even if, even if some of it might involve me waving papers around at you. No. All right, we got uh, Florida, Massachusetts, Nova Scotia, Arizona, Detroit, Ireland, New York, Oklahoma in the house. All right, so basically, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Magu, but uh, uh, I came across the ancient Chinese goddess uh, a couple years ago, and I was like, that's pretty cool, and you know, basically, how, how old were the first kind of, you know, paintings or artifacts that depicted her? Oh my gosh, there is, well, hemp, hemp and cannabis use. Oh my gosh, like where to, where to begin? I'm like, this is right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start in the beginning. I got a lot of questions. But anyway, so, so I, I talked to, you know, I was like, hey, future cannabis art correspondent, uh, uh, can you do a deep dive on this? And you said gladly. And so you you locked yourself in your house and basically yep. did two weeks of research on Magu. And uh, so why don't we kick it off? Why don't I mean, you? Uh, I, I'm going to hand it off to you. And, you uh, <laughs> and while you're doing that, I'm going to be eating. Can you see those? You oh my gosh! Nice <laughs> spicy peanuts. <laughs> Well, I hope that I have some spicy peanuts of information for you today. Um, I, I have the chat open. I can see you guys are in Ottawa and, and uh, California. That's awesome. I'm in, I'm in California too. Um, just a little, a little background on me. I'm a, I'm a model and artist based out of California, but I was born and raised in Hong Kong. Um, I'm half Chinese, half Dutch, and I just feel like the conversation between East and West is so much a part of my uh, my deal, my identity. And this this conversation I'm having with you today is really bringing together my love of the arts and art history and cannabis, which I'm very passionate about because we totally saved my life. So here we go. 
So cannabis has been cultivated in China since Neolithic times. Neolithic basically means when the Neolithic revolution is when people figured out how to farm. But that's not to say that farming is the only nor even the most efficient method of sustenance in, in China. But there is there's basically been hemp in China since at least 5,000 years before the birth of Christ. Um, I'm gonna be saying BCE and CE instead of BC and AD because we say before the common era and common era to denote those two. It's the same thing though, BC and, and AD, like it's the same, it's to do with, the, with that ch chunk of time, especially because we're talking to mostly people in the US today, judging by the chat. And I, I will be making things clear in that way. So. You may have heard of her as the Chinese goddess of hemp and cannabis, and that's true, but it's also important to realize, here we go, Qing Dynasty painting. I love this one. <laughs> it's uh, ink on silk, which is it's just so lucky that it's been preserved. I love that beautiful blue dye there. Blue dye so, is the most expensive. So actually, I, I got to figure it. I realize it's weird. <laughs> if anybody watching knows on Zoom, when there are three people in the Zoom, I can spotlight a video, but when it's only two of us, uh, for some reason, I can't spotlight the video. So let me just quickly, because if I pin the video. Um, anyway, uh, everybody, so I have to talk for a second so everyone can actually see my <laughs> screen. So anyway, this is what she's talking about. <laughs> can everyone see Mangu, that beautiful Qing Dynasty hanging? Actually, you know what? I can log in with my cell phone and then, uh... anyway, all right, keep talking. I also, and I'll, I also I'll want, to thank, <laughs> I want to thank Cactus Jack for mentioning, <laughs> for mentioning that, they, that there was a grave in China found with, with cannabis resin. And I love it when archaeology uncovers something so human and relatable. Like, I believe that, that was it Dogfish Head, the beer company? like basically made a new beer that was based on like like fruit and 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 hops resin that was found in like an ancient cup. I love it. There's like humans have always been humans and art history teaches us that teaches us that over and over again. And with uh are we are we ready to go? Are we have we figured out the zoom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let let's uh let's do it. All <laughs> right, so now I can <laughs> I joined on my phone, so now I can do that. All right. <laughs> nice. So Zoom hacks. You got that. You got that pro account, that premium account, Steve. <laughs> um, we can see her here. This is a Qing Dynasty rendition. Qing Dynasty is a little bit, a little bit later on. We can see the blue sash around her waist. Blue is a very expensive dye. So whenever you see blue in old art, you know that whoever they're painting is important because it is expensive to paint them as such. It's important to note that imperial Chinese relationship, the imperial Chinese relationship with God and Taoist, Taoism's relationship with gods is very, very different than what we have in the West. In the West, we have a sort of an industrialized Judeo-Christian model where it's kind of monotheistic and a lot of early Christian kings were like, oh yes, this is a good, met like this Christianity is a good metaphor for me. And so it's a very, it sort of got politically industrialized in a way that didn't happen with Taoism in, uh, in East Asia. And Taoist gods are not like, there's not just one, there's a ship. <laughs> and we refer to them as Tian, which means like immortal or celestial or just sort of like a, a spirit. And all of them are powerful, but they're not necessarily benevolent. So it's very different notion of spirituality if that, if that makes sense. Um, but, uh, I'm just catching up, making sure. Oh, yes. And quite a few of these Sien, quite a few of these Celestials were mortal people, according to legend, were mortal people that ascended to immortality through learning techniques, through discipline, that kind of thing. The next pick, the next picture we have, actually, number two, is from seven. Look, at this is like not the ideal aspect ratio for YouTube, but there is a reason for that. <laughs> This is from 17, uh, this is from 7th century master Wu Daozi, who lived from 670 to 760. This is his scroll, 87 celestials. So unlike Christianity, we have, this is 87 of the many celestial beings. And a scroll like this, going back to that aspect ratio thing, would be read by 
scrolling up some and unscrolling others so you'd like go along it in a line and that's why it's this long shape so you could kind of experience the single image sequentially and therefore almost lend it narrative capability you can think of this if you like as like I don't know, a seven, seventh century comic book. And a lot of Chinese painting has this relationship with time. And so does Taoism. Taoism has a fascinating relationship with time too. So look at all these celestials. They're dressed to the nines. They have very elaborate coiffed hair, lanterns, lots and lots of fabric. I mean, this is a time when fabric's woven by hand. So you can tell how, how fancy these people are. <laughs> these are 87 celestials, but I also wanted to give a more sort of a, like literal, I guess, example of a mortal person who ascended to spirit, like to godhood or to immortality in in Taoist canon. And one of the examples is actually Confucius. We have that's our next picture. Uh, from this is an image of Confucius from the Tang Dynasty. So, despite Confucius founding a whole school of thought that is like separate from Taoism. In, in sort of a, from the Taoist religious perspective, he ascends and has become like one of these Xian Fai, but just kind of the long way around. It's kind of like he's achieved Taoist spiritual goals kind of in his own way. So I don't want to give a, a sort of a historical example of someone who's considered having achieved apotheosis. Apotheosis is the process by which a mortal becomes a god. And so ascension is also another word that's often used, but apotheosis is very common in Roman art history. Like if you see sculptures of emperors becoming gods, that's, that's what it's about. Um, and this notion of immortality is re relevant to Ma Gu, the hemp maiden, because she's very much associated with longevity. And this sort of immortal Xian thing is appropriate for her, be it in Taoist philosophy where she would be considered where immortality is about being spiritually immortal or in Taoist religion where it's about being physically immortal or in Chinese alchemy which is about the pursuit of the elixir of life so Magu is heavily our hemp maiden heavily associated with longevity and the elixir of life and in all those different subcategories too which I think is fascinating I've blabbered on for quite a bit now so I want to pause and check the chat and see if we have questions <laughs> I think everybody's rolling their joints right now. <laughs> um, uh, Teddy B asked, does, did Confucius smoke pot? Oh my goodness. I wish we had more evidence, but we don't know. We are going to hit upon a pretty great scholar, though, who, who, who did smoke weed, uh, an early Chinese scholar and philosopher who did. Confucius, we simply don't know. Um, he was writing after... He was writing before the, the Warring States period, which was which decimated China. China invented total war thousands of years before the West did. And he wrote, so in, in, in that big, horrible Warring States period, a lot, of, a lot of artifacts were lost. So we don't know, but how exciting would it be to find a resin pipe like a cactus, cactus Jack mentioned? <laughs> Absolutely, that's funny. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think it's time we should actually look at the Chinese characters because this, I am hoping, will blow more minds than mine. This is Ma Gu. This is the Chinese, modern day Chinese script. So on the left, Ma uh, is the word for hemp, and on the right, Gu is the word, it's a sort of a word for maiden, uh, young woman, but it's also a word for aunt, like your, your father's sister is referred to as Gu Gu, like, uh, but as we go to the next slide, we'll have a closer look at the word for hemp. Let's see. So this word for hemp is comprised of a radical for a roof and for plants. These two, uh, the other two radicals inside the roof is the word for tree, but it's it's twice. So it's like plants. I, I like that it literally looks like uh, <laughs> drying, you know, weed drying on a on a hanger. Right. <laughs> I I think I feel like I once I saw this character, I was like, oh my goodness. It be, this character is from a bronze age ideograph. So it's it's really, I'm like, I'm such a nerd for language. I'm getting goosebumps, literally, <laughs> literally thinking about this, but it's like human history hidden in our language. And here you can see hemp plants drying in a shed, and that this pictogram is is still in modern use today. 
this word uh, ma also shows up in the Chinese word for anesthetic, which is ma zui, but it can also mean narcotic. So isn't that telling? <laughs> um, and I believe the next picture is of that Zhou age, um, the Bronze Age Zhou Dynasty ideograph. Um, and I think if you had to write that a lot, it, it, you know, to make it, this happens with a lot of language, in order to write that character faster, those, those lines will like slowly join up and become what we have today. But it's just fascinating. The Zhou Dynasty happened, uh, it ended 300 years BCE. So, so plants were hanging in a shed in China at least 300 years before the birth of Christ. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's cool. I, uh, people who follow me will know that I, I don't know how to grow, but I really admire growers. And I just feel excited to present this character to people who might see this kind of thing every day. <laughs> Let's see, okay, etymology. Oh, yes. Um, so in Korea, Magu is called Mago, and she figures as an important- uh, I, I, Am I on the right slide? Oh, this that's the next one yeah we'll go we'll go to uh, we'll get there i didn't i didn't i it's fine though i didn't pull any korean or japanese art for this but i did find some idioms so in korea magu is called mago and she's sort of more of a pro progenitress a uh, sovereign she's often also a giant like she's just physically a lot bigger in creation myths but in um in 2004 korean scholar hai Sukhwang wrote their book an investigation of gynocentric unity uh, in Mago, the East Asian great goddess and elsewhere. And this is a quote from that book. They write, Magoism, the archaic gynocentric cultural matrix of East Asia derives from the worship of Mago as creatress, progenitress and sovereign. So very much sort of part of the creation cycle. Um, and in Japanese, Magu is called Mako, but there's a lot of different tones. So not every Mako is a reference to Maku, but she's called Mako. And she's also known for having long, beautiful fingernails. So uh, I'm gonna murder this pronunciation. I don't speak Japanese, but if you were to say Mako Soyo, Soyo, I think, it's an idiom which means uh, Mako is scratching an itch, which means things are going as planned, <laughs> which I like. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> We've talked about uh, the differences between uh, sort of Eastern and Western relationships and spirituality. I think one of the most striking is this, one of the most striking is the difference in sort of the physical context of worship. In the West, we have cathedrals and churches and this kind of thing, but uh, Taoists, and this is the next slide, uh, have these things called grotto heavens, and a grotto heaven or Dongtian is a beautifully appointed place in nature where you can go and and practice meditation or whatever you need to do and it's very much in a garden or a mountain or park somewhere scenic wonderfully appointed to achieve your spiritual goals but not the alcoves themselves can be man-made but it's very much not about being in a, like a big enclosed cathedral like we might imagine a place of worship in the west but that isn't to say that there aren't rules and there aren't very like they aren't like very uh special and limited because i believe there's only 46 official dongtian and um magus is the 28th of them so this is this is one such example of like a, a holy cave uh, magus grotto heaven is on magu shan which is magu mountain which makes sense um let's see just making sure da, da, da. Grotto heaven. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I really like the idea of sort of trying to achieve spiritual goals in nature rather than- Wait, this. so- Yeah. <laughs> so, so just quickly, you said she's one of 28 what? Deities so, or- Magus, So they're Magu's place of worship or one of her most important places of worship, Ma, uh, uh, her grotto heaven is one of only 46 grotto heavens in China. So in China, there are 46 places which Taoists consider supremely appointed to achieve your spiritual goals. And they're, they're alcoves in nature, like sacred caves, if you will. And some of them are, have been like whittled, but they're very much in nature themselves. There's only 46 of them and hers is the 28th. And, and is each one kind of linked to a different deity? 
Yes, or more than one. Okay. So like two deities could share the same beautiful spot. Yeah, it's very much about uh, association too. Like more than one deity is associated with the elixir of life, for example, but how much they are is what matters and how much they are will, will determine how much that uh, god or goddess figures in art. So, um, so for example, because Magu's association with longevity is so strong, she shows up in a lot of like wishes for a long life. Here's a painting of Magu holding some immortality peaches. And it's like, it's, it's very much like that kind of thing. Let's see. And the grotto heavens themselves, like this one, um, attract a lot of famous poets, musicians, scholars, emperors, even military leaders, sometimes all the same person in Chinese history, to go and write books there and everything. Um, famous Tang Dynasty Taoist calligrapher, Yan Zhenting. We can go to the next one, yeah. So Yan Zhenting visited Mount Magu, and he made an inscription there called Record of the Mountain platform where Magu ascended to immortality. So the inscription that he put there was was like, here, here's the spot where Magu went from being a mortal woman to an immortal woman. You know, the, here's here's the like rock where she left off. This is an example of his calligraphy from Xi'an. This is part, uh, let's see, da, da, da. this is part of the Yan Xinli steel. And notice he has really thick vertical strokes, really thin horizontal strokes. So uh, calligraphy is its own school of art in China, and it, it goes beyond uh, it goes beyond in terms of philosophy and style what we might be able to interpret <laughs> with U.S. eyes. But basically, the style he had was a lot more muscular. It's de described as very um, structured compared to early Tang Dynasty calligraphy, which is described as capricious and decorative. And I, I think that it's, it's fascinating that this really important calligrapher who's credited with summing up 500 years of style with his own style decided that it was important to travel to Mount Magu and, and to make an inscription about her ascension, her apotheosis. Um, let's see. There's the next picture. Uh, this is a, a painting of Magu from the Ming or Qing dynasty. The inscription that Yan Tenzing wrote on, on Mount Magu has been copied out onto this work of art by, uh, by Emperor Gao, Gao Zong from the Qing dynasty. So in Chinese art, it was pretty common if you owned, if you like inherited a painting, you would put your seal on it, your stamp on it, or copy out some calligraphy on it to sort of put your print on it for the person who would inherit it after you. This seems like defacement sometimes to, to Western ears, but it doesn't really work that way when you're an emperor <laughs> with a really important seal. And it also provides a pretty handy record, but there's an example of the inscription. And yeah, you could tell that even hundreds of years later uh, in the Qing dynasty, they were thinking of this Tang dynasty calligrapher as very important and his work to be worth uh, replicating. So, so wait, often, j j just quickly with what you're talking about, I see lots of little characters up top and then the like the red stamps uh, are, are the little characters up top these things, anything? I mean, obviously there's something, but yeah, yeah. So the, um, the red stamps are called chops, and that's basically what you would chop onto a work to be like, I owned this at one point, you know? And then later on, you could look at your painting and be like, wow, so many important people owned this thing that I now own. Got it. So yeah, if you see, um, and notice the characters inside the chops also change. So if the character in the chop is, uh, more modern and more boxy looking, it places it at a different point in time than if they looked closer to those Zhou Dynasty ideographs that happened 300 years before the birth of Christ, so the lines are squigglier. It's kind of like how in, in English we have Old English, Middle English, Shakespearean English, Chinese also has evolved a lot through time, especially in the written, in the written form, you can really see it. Um, Let's see. So of her mortal ascension into immortality, scholar Ebenhart wrote in 1968, this ascent to heaven, typical of Taoists, connects her with the immortal saints, and indeed she is regarded as a symbol of long life and rebirth, 
and therefore in the Chinese drama appears as a good omen during birthday celebrations. So she's very basically a popular deity to have around on your birthday. And the next picture uh, is an especially, um, this next picture was uh, recently sold actually, this work of art it is called Birthday Wishes from Magu. So this is a, an artwork you might give to someone on their birthday to wish them long life. And there she is with her peaches of immortality and some leaves, which they could be hemp leaves, <laughs> but you get the idea. Like, I, I wish you long life. Here's a painting of Magu. And yeah, so this was painted in 1951 to give you an idea of just the span of time. All right, any questions before we move on to some like origin story stuff? <laughs> I'm just checking. Uh, so, so, so you 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 actually just mentioned and uh, by English I mean someone who speaks English natively. I don't know if he's American or or uh, British or something. But wasn't it only in like the '60s that kind of the West discovered Magu? I like Western I scholars or something. I think I read something like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a uh, Joseph Needham is a scholar we'll be talking a lot about, and he and his right. team did a lot of research, and it was very much like seven. All the publications I've been looking at are all like late '60s and '70s stuff for sure. I feel like a lot of work um, for sinographers is is it's very inscrutable sometimes until you like roll up your sleeves and you're like not afraid to deal with thousands and thousands of years for sure, and and then the translation too. Yeah, I'm looking through there. I think looking everyone's just <laughs> <laughs> catching up all the peaches. <laughs> peaches of immortality. Well, if you think about it, pretty much every tradition of polytheism has some form of fantastical thing that gods eat, like Zeus and Apollo ate ambrosia on Mount Olympus to stay alive. And in the East, they ate peaches. <laughs> um, all right. So you asked at the beginning, I wanted to give a little context about her. Um, I wanted to give a little context about Taoism and her places of worship and all that before we moved on to the hagiography and, and ha hagia. Ocrophy. Hagia is the Latin prefix for sainthood. So whenever you see hagiography, it means writing about saints, writing about holy individuals. And I, I only just learned this yesterday and I was like, <laughs> um, but I was like, oh, maybe that's why Hagia Sophia has that name, like Saint Sophia, right? But um, I wanted to give a little context about uh, Eastern spirituality in that way and the theism relationship being so different than Christianity before we sort of dive into some scripture. <laughs> so the earliest description, the earliest writing we have about Magu is in Biographies of the Divine Immortals by Ge Hong from 317 CE. So this is 317 years after the birth of Christ. At this point, the Roman Empire is falling apart and Europe is a, is a mess. And this is what's happening in China. This uh, this hagiography. So in this, in this biography of the divine immortals, Ge Hong writes, um, writes about uh, burning cannabis in ritual incense burners. And so the image we have there, the Tang Dynasty ritual incense burner, that would be like a, a tabletop kind of thing. That's number, let's see, birthday wishes, number 11. And it's really beautiful. Um, so he wrote about burning cannabis in ritual incense burners. He wrote, for those who begin practicing the Tao, it is not necessary to go into the mountains. Some with purifying in incense are also able to call down the perfected immortals. You may use such an incense burner to do that purification, but not all of them were tabletop. The other picture we have is of one that's on a chain that I, but it's Tang Dynasty, Tang Dynasty incense burner but I, I really like it. It looks to me- Wait, sorry, am I, am I cutting to this thing? Yes, Is please, that, uh, the next sorry. one, yes, please. <laughs> sorry, everybody. <laughs> I thought I'd include this ritual incense burner from the Tang Dynasty, yeah, the next one, because it almost Look. looks like a, like a Catholic censor, doesn't it? Like, 
um, that one might swing while like walking down the aisle of a church, but this is one from a completely different geographical region that you can still put burnable material in. I feel like, I feel like as a modern stoner almost looking at this, I'm like, but then how are you gonna get all the smoke from the hash and the this? I'm used to seeing volcanoes and I'm like, what are stores in Bickle gonna make a ritual incense burner? <laughs> 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 but it's just I just think it's beautiful and you can see how it would swing and then there's a there's I don't know if that's like a gyroscopic thing to hold the hash in but fascinating and definitely only uh, yeah, for yeah, yeah and I see the little gyroscope inside <laughs> Tang Dynasty so really relatively early too so we can we can keep this up while we talk about Ge Hong's writing so Ge Hong wrote about a man named Wang who quits his official post working for an emperor and heads off into the mountains to try and achieve immortality Wang's friend said he will return on the seventh day of the seventh month so note this seventh day seventh month thing upon returning on the seventh day of the seventh month the now immortal Wang wishes to invite Ma Gu to join in the celebration. So this is the earliest piece of writing we have about Ma Gu. He says, it has been a long time since you were in the human realm. So it turns out that in this story, Ma Gu is spending time on this mythical island called Peng Lai, like sort of how we have this mythical island in the West we call Atlantis. In, in the East, East Asian Sea, there's supposed to be this mythical island called Peng Lai. And some think that the legend was started by a mirage effect that happens in the, in the north. But on this island is the fountain of youth, the elixir of, of immortality, all of this stuff. And she spent a lot of time there. And so much so that she responds by invisible messenger and says, without realizing it, more than 500 years have passed. I think we've all lost track of time too, <laughs> for one reason or another. Um, I'm just going to read the quote now, if that's cool. So. So let's see. So this is the excerpt from Ge Hong's writing. She appeared to be a handsome woman of 18 or 19. Her hair was done up and several loose strands hung around her waist. Her gown had a pattern of colors, but it was not woven. It shimmered, dazzling the eyes and was indescribable. It was not of this world. She approached and bowed to Wang, who bade her rise. When they were both seated, they called for the traveling canteen. So a traveling canteen is a, a magic feast that immortals can summon at will. So they both like summoned it like at the, like at will, this amazing traveling feast. The servings were piled up on gold platters and jade cups without limit. There were rare delicacies, many of them made from fruit and flowers and their fragrance permeated the air inside the home and out. When the meat was sliced, it resembled broiled mo and was announced to be Kirin meat. So uh, if we go to the next picture, if any of you have played Monster Hunter World, you may have battled a Karen, but it's a chimeric animal that some people will call like Chinese unicorn. But that's what Magu, yep, that one, that's what Magu and Wang are eating in this story. They're eating a, a, a broiled Karen. They said it resembled Mo, which is a word for a taper. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a taper. They're like the large land mammals with strange noses. But yeah, I don't know if you would eat one of these. This is a Qing Dynasty sculpture of a Kirin. I'm just checking. <laughs> yeah, I am a gamer. <laughs> so I swear, I swear, like without like video games and smoking weed, it's just what gets me through the day, man. <laughs> and art. <laughs> but, but yeah, this this Kirin, if you have brought one down in Monster Hunter World, you've gotten further in that game than I have. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and the next picture is a picture of a Tang Dynasty feast. Oh, not that oh. one. There's a, there's a, did I not include the feast one? Do you, do you want to send it to me and I can queue it up? Oh, it's okay. It's, it's of a feast. You can imagine it. But this next map is a great thing. <laughs> it's a great thing to have up for the next bit. I'm just going to catch up on the chat comments here. I don't want to miss anything. The... <laughs> Woods Tang. <laughs> I've heard that Wu-Tang Clan are nothing to fuck with. Heard, <laughs> correct me if I'm mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> they have those at the tea house in Portland. Oh, cool. Yeah, they're like they're they're like guardian animals a lot of the time, like protective spiritual beasts. They're, they're fascinating, chimeric. 
I'm so I'm so happy, so happy the hemp goddess is not vegan. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, is this 300 years after the birth of Christ? And I was looking at broiled mo, and it does translate to to tapir, but it also translates to giant panda. And I'm like, the idea that there were enough pandas around that you would just eat them is such a foreign concept to modern day China, like where they're very, very protected, treasured beasts. Like right. there must have just been a lot Ta more. Taking down a panda that's just like sitting there quietly munching on bamboo and minding its own oh, business. No. Although I feel like stoners can relate to a panda's attitude on life a lot of time. It's yes. like, yeah, looks like some good priority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One day I want to travel out east and see the architecture and landscape on the bucket list. <laughs> Yeah, so before I actually, why don't we queue up the map and then? So you're you said you're from Hong Kong, but have you have you spent a lot? Have you traveled around China at all? Or yes. Um. So, so one thing you got to know about Chinese art history is that a lot of Chinese imperial art was burned, destroyed, and ruined, just like desecrated during the Cultural Revolution. So if you want to see paintings and sculptures, you got to go to Taiwan, where the previous uh, regime kind of just like took them all but in China you can still see the architecture that still stands like the summer palace which we'll talk about the great wall is there and I so I was born and raised in Hong Kong I moved to America when I turned 18 for college and then I decided to stay here I was like I had a bagel and I was like this is magic <laughs> I'm gonna live in the west <laughs> Um, but for, there are more reasons than that, but I do remember having my first bagel in New York. Um, I have traveled in China a lot though. So as a kid, I traveled in the North a lot. And then um, after I graduated college, having studied studio art and art history, I traveled in um, around Guilin to see some of the mountains that had inspired Song Dynasty paintings. And I cannot, I cannot describe to you how beautiful the topology is in China. Like we don't have anything like it in the US in terms of mountains. This like, when you see in Chinese paintings, these mountains that go like straight up and down, that's not fancy, they exist. You can go see them. It's really, really something to behold. And Guilin, the, the area is famous for that specifically. It's for those mountains for inspiring a lot of painting. So yeah, just, highly recommend. Just, just quickly, Hetty B asked what stoner culture is like in Hong Kong. So what's the weed scene like in Hong Kong? Oh, cannabis is very, very much uh, frowned upon in, uh, cannabis is classified in the same like ranking as, uh, as like ecstasy basically, or MDMA much more, things that we consider much more serious in the West. It is totally illegal, but CBD is really trendy in Hong Kong right now. And it's been interesting. Um, I have a friend who, who, who operates a Medi Spa there and she was talking to me about importing CBD. And basically in Hong Kong, you can't import anything that's full spectrum or anything with any THC in it, even a trace amount. Uh, and so it's interesting in the West where we have some uh, pharmacological studies that show that having a little bit of THC with your CBD helps to like activate it, you know? You can't do that in Hong Kong. So it's been it's been an interesting thing to, to navigate. But yeah, that's a good question. Oh, there are birds in Hong Kong, last cookie. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of cockatiels, the like white birds with the yellow mohawks. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> Just checking on the duh. Just catching up. Uh, Hong Kong, they speak Portuguese still. Last cookie, I think you might be thinking of Macau. There's so uh, Hong Kong was a British colony and Macau was a Portuguese colony. And I know this difference isn't important to a lot of people, but our egg tarts are better than their egg tarts, okay? <laughs> Hong Kong egg tarts are better than Portuguese egg tarts from Macau. Just saying. I have a lot of pride about our desserts, okay? Hong Kong desserts are the best. <laughs> Don't are fuck with egg tarts. <laughs> I mean, I'll eat them, but they're not the same. 
there's always that the food you grow up with is always the most prized uh, munchie, right? But to point out a little bit about where some of these things are. So in the South, you can see Hong Kong SAR and Macau SAR. Those are the two regions I was talking about just now. Um, Macau being the former Portuguese colony, Hong Kong being the uh, former British colony. And then if we go, uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then there's the there's the East Asian Sea, there's Taiwan, uh, and then in that sea is where Peng Lai, the, the, the mirage may have shown up. If we go north to where that circle is, we come across this region called the Ordus Loop. So throughout Asian history, the Ordus Loop, where this circle is, is one of the most hotly contested pieces of land ever. It is, and it's been battled for back and forth from, from all different types of people. The bend in the Yellow River there means that it's incredibly, incredibly fertile land for both pasture land and for farming. So you have steppe people from the north who are nomadic and they need pasture land for grazing. It's prime real estate for them. And then from the south or more, you have what would become the Han Chinese people who prefer farming really wanted for farming. So this region is just, just the hottest girl at the party. And you may not know this, but the Great Wall of China, the, great, the building of the Great Wall of China was not a defensive measure. It was an offensive measure to say, this much up north is ours. So it was like very much like drawing a line in the sand further north than had generally been agreed upon beforehand. So yeah, most people think of the Great Wall as like a defense against the evil northerners, but it was actually being like, hey, northerners, this is ours. <laughs> so yeah, and that's a lot to do with the Otis Loop, the Otis Plateau, which is this, this area. And it is in this area we find the earliest use of hemp in Chinese culture, 4,800 years before the birth of Christ. So 4,800 years before the birth of Christ in this region, if we go to the next picture, we have, pottery with hemp on it. <laughs> um, Yangshou culture, which was living here, had a practice of using hemp in decorative ways in, that has been preserved in a way that hemp ropes wouldn't actually be preserved down to us. Like the ropes would have rotted from that long ago, so we wouldn't be able to still pick them up. But they used twisted ropes and pressed them into, the, into their pottery, into this amphora. You can see the, the the pattern on the outside, and it's just a stripe in the middle. Exactly, exactly. So Yangshou culture people have twisted hemp and they're pressing it into the, into the pottery to make that pattern. And this is an amphora. An amphora is a tall earthenware jug that you store stuff in. So <laughs> um, you may have seen Greek or, or Roman amphora. Roman amphora are very, very uh, common in art history museums. There's a whole hill in Rome made out of discarded amphora that used to have olive oil in them. And this is an example of a Yangshou culture amphora with hemp prints. So I love that. Like even though the plants themselves did not survive for more than 5,000 years down to us, we have imprints of the plants. I've seen um, some weed brands like on Instagram spray painting cannabis leaves onto onto like furniture or onto like clothes. And it's like, if the weed plant itself didn't live, someone can look at this, this uh, say handbag or, or mask that has a weed leaf on it and be like, they had weed. <laughs> it's, it makes me wonder about what in our society will remain to those down the line from us. <laughs> but the next picture is also of a, also of a Yangshou culture um, piece. And you can, you can see there's a bit, bit of a better contrast there where you, where the ropes are. It's just, it's, I like that it's decorative. I don't know. I don't know. I just want to catch up on the chats. If there's any brands you guys like that have that kind of decoration, any modern equivalents of Yangshou culture, I'd love to know. Here, D DBLR, I don't know what your deal is, but uh... <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> 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 okay so so, so, uh, so what what are you smoking right now i'm smoking some plain jane this these pre-rolls um i wanted to actually bring up a point um hodel 
or H O D L crypto. Um, when you those characters, Zhongguo, that you say we comes from China, Zhongguo. So Zhongguo means the central kingdom. And originally, that didn't mean China. That meant the earthly plane on which we all live. <laughs> it meant like, it meant the earthly plane in which we all live, outside of which is terrifying spirits and monsters and gods. I really hope some of them are on our side. So I'm glad you brought that up. If you look at the, the first character there for China, Zong, the rectangle with a line in the middle, it means central because it's a rectangle with a line in the middle. So it means the central place, this earthly plane. And it was only when trade started happening and people started meeting other people and being like, oh wait, there's more than just this country. Earthly plane is just gonna be the name for, for, our, for our country. It's funny how that stuff works out. But let's see, it just go. Pe pe people are happy that their art history professor is uh, lighting a joint while she's uh, <laughs> dropping knowledge. Oh my gosh, well, I have a fatty ass dab loaded for the end. It's just that I don't want to trip over my own tongue and I want to be, uh, <laughs> I just want to be clear in case anyone is Googling this. And I'm also doing it in, too, in like a, in translating from the Chinese too. And so I'm hoping to, to yeah, but. I think we can basically talk about now the Taoist relationship with cannabis, which has existed for a really long time. Scholar Joseph Needham, you were talking about- Yes, Mazzuoli. we've all been on the edge of our seats waiting for, for Joseph Needham to come back <laughs> into the conversation. <laughs> so he connected early religious use of cannabis and Taoism to Magu. So for example, Magu is worshiped on Mount Pai, a uh, Shandong province mountain, which is associated with rebirth and renewal and this is uh this is a natural rock formation on mount tai which is called the bridge of the immortals and i'm i'm personally impressed <laughs> i yeah, uh <laughs> that, that looks man-made but that's pretty yeah. impressive <laughs> and this is like honestly just a tiny slice of some of the dope mountains in china like there are mountains that if they were here would be nationwide famous, but it's like just another mountain because it's in a province full of crazy mountains. It's fascinating. And some of the farming techniques developed on those mountains with the steps are really beautiful because during sunrise and sunset, all those watery steps are like glowing gold. It's really kind of impossible to describe. Uh, sorry, and just quickly, where, where is this? Like if we looked at that map. Oh yeah, uh, so let's see, Shandong province. Shandong province is east, super east, like on the coast. Okay, so this is yeah. near the coast in a mountain range. Yeah, this is considered the foremost of the five great mountains in China. So this is like a really big deal one. Um, but this, I'm saying that this view, there's like a ton of, ton of beautiful mountains worth seeing. And on Mount Tai, um, hemp is traditionally cultivated. Uh, Needham and his team write that historically, the cannabis harvest that were, were supposed to happen on this place were, were supposed to be gathered on the seventh day of the seventh month, a day of seance and banquets in the Dao, in Taoist communities on Mount Dai. So I want to bring this up again. We were talking about the seventh day, seventh month thing. So Magu returns on the seventh day of the seventh month. Wang returns on the seventh day of the seventh month. Hemp plants are harvested here. And if I'm not mistaken, grower people, please weigh in on this. But from seed to flower, isn't it between six and nine months for a cannabis plant to self-actualize? Yeah, you, well, usually, I mean, the, the photo period, I mean, as, as the season gets shorter, that's what's triggering the flowering. And then every cultivar kind of has its own finishing, but yes. So, but, but that seven months and, and seven days period sounds right to you? Uh, it sounds close. <laughs> I guess we don't have a lot of information about what cultivar they had, but this continual sacred repetition of seven months, like the seventh day of the seventh month kind of thing, I think bears a fascinating resemblance to, to botany. And cannabis is also mentioned as growing on Mount Tai in the oldest Chinese pharmacopoeia, which was written by Bun Kao Jing, uh, who also invented first aid was writing about, <laughs> writing about cannabis saying, uh, this is, oh, by the way, this is in uh, the Tang Dynasty. So he wrote, the flowers when they burst are called ma fen or ma bo, 
The best time for gathering is the seventh day of the seventh month. The seeds are gathered on the ninth month. The seeds which have entered the soil are injurious to man and it grows on Mount Tai. So I don't like CD Bud either. <laughs> <laughs> But I just think that's fascinating. It shows up in the Ban Kao Ding, which is a 100 to 250 years after the birth of Christ. So the Roman Empire isn't even falling apart yet. And in the Ban Kao Ding in East Asia, we're writing about seeds. Um, so, and in the Taoist encyclopedia, the Wushang Biao, it has a chapter entitled, entitled Supreme Secret Essentials in which cannabis is described in ritual incense burners. And this is in, the next picture is a ritual incense burner from the Qing dynasty. So I thought this would kind of bring in two of the things we've talked about already. This is from the Qing dynasty. It's an incense burner, but it's an incense burner in the shape of a Kirin. So Monster Hunter fans again. <laughs> I, I just, I, I love this, this image and uh, gives you a better, a better look at their face too. But you see those horns? Um, just beautiful and, and so elaborate. And yeah. And again, ritual incense burner as the as the primary method of consumption. Again, come on, stores in Bickle. <laughs> uh, I, al <laughs> I also wanted to show you a picture of what Mount Magu looks like today, which is the next uh, spot. And Magu appears uh, relevant to the Taoist understanding of time, which is very cyclic because while worshiping on Mount Magu, Taoist scholars on the top of the mountain discovered seashells and they were like, okay, time might go in circles. Geologic time might exist, you guys. Things, the earth moves at a different pace than our human bodies do because they discovered seashells so high up. And it's interesting that Taoism has a very, in general, a very cyclic relationship with history and with time. And it's not correct to say that it's circular, but um, I mean, my, my younger brother, who is very much uh, into Chinese history, described it as a spiral downward, sort of a, a little bit bummer, but ultimately in a, in a repeating way. So, um, so oceans turn to fields, turn to oceans, you know? So let's see, da, 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 da. so Mount Magu is also interestingly an important Buddhist site. But in Buddhist folklore, she's not referred to as like a, a god to be appealed to so much as like a fairy, a fairy spirit. And there are Buddhist folk legends about Mount Magu, where Magu is, is like a fairy queen with a fairy king kind of idea. So you can see how these stories can get tangled and, and they would borrow from, from one another. Uh, da, 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 in the Shan King, okay, so let's start by talking about the Shan, Shan King school of Taoism. So Taoism, like Christianity, it's not just one thing. There's a whole lot of different sects. So in Christianity, we might say there's, a, there's this type of Protestantism and this type of Catholicism. And then of that type, there are subgenres and subgenres and, and all the, and different sort of categories. Same thing happens in Taoism. And in Taoism, one of the subcategories is called the Shangqing School of Taoism. And the Shangqing School of Taoism uh, was founded um, by a series of revelations, which scholar Joseph Needham <laughs> says are almost assuredly aided by cannabis. So this scholar, Yang Si uh, was his name, had them between 364 and 337. You may notice we keep returning to like the 300s. And this is a very, it's a very like interesting time in, in Chinese history. A lot of stuff happened. This is right after the Warring States period where a third of the population was decimated by total war. And, and it was like a lot of like building up from, from scratch again for many people. But that also meant a lot of room for innovation in, in many ways. So, um, yeah, oh, and the next picture, by the way, is an inscription of what the uh, of of je, modern je, day. Je, just quickly, uh, let me give everybody some Joseph Needham context. He was a British biochemist, historian, and sinologist, known for his scientific research and writing on the history of Chinese science and technology. So, anyway. Yeah, he was on a he was on a team that also included Chinese people when doing this research, by the way. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so then so say, yep, so that's just a picture of the 
uh, Magu inscription that you can visit today and notice that they've written it kind of like if you were to visit a historical a site in English and they've written a quote in old fashioned English, Magu, right, is like written in that, that uh, Zhou Dynasty audiograph that we were looking at before. Um, I like this, uh, this quote from Yangtze. So Yangtze, this, uh, one of the founders of the Sanxing school of Taoism, Yangtze uh, wrote about a 24 ingredient elixir that could be consumed in a mixture of hemp juice and this is what he says about drinking it, drinking it. A daily dosage allowed one to divide his body and become 10,000 men and to ride through the air. And his successor, Tao Hongjing, found a copy of the recipe, but unfortunately it is lost to posterity, but does make me wonder, I'm sure you've had all kinds of infused drinks, uh, CBD, hemp, or otherwise, and I, I feel like next time I have a, a glass of Rebel Coast or something, I'm gonna be like, is my body dividing into 10,000 men? Is it? Uh. <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> Although he, he uh, purportedly had these revelations where he talked to divine beings at, in the evenings and was edited by Tao Han Jing later. Um, Tao Han Jing is the author of one of, my, one of my favorite phrases to describe people who work with hemp plants and people who work with cannabis. And it's in this quote, he says, Hemp seeds are very little used in medicine, but magician technicians say that if one consumes them with ginseng, it will give you knowledge of the future. So I don't know about you, but when I was in my first job as a trimmer, I would love it if someone referred to me as a magician technician. <laughs> that girl knows how to trim. <laughs> I was bad at trimming, but I, we, we all we all have had a trim job at some point in our lives. I feel like. <laughs> Ta -da! Okay, and I have a quote from Needham himself, um, who says, "Thus, in all the, the this is a quote from him that he wrote in 1974. Thus, all in all, there is much reason for thinking that the ancient Taoists experimented systematically with hallucinogenic smokes using techniques which arose directly out of liturgical, liturgical observance. At all events, with the incense burner remaining at the center of changes and transformations associated with worship, sacrifice, ascending perfume, and sweet savor fire, combustion, disintegration, transformation, vision, and communication with spiritual beings, and assurances of immortality. And I think that I think that pretty much uh, sums it up. But I do want to mention some later depictions of Magu. Uh, we don't have to all be before the year 400. <laughs> um, so this one, this is a painting of Magu that one might present even nowadays to an elderly, uh, an elderly uh, respected female relative in the house. You might give this someone give this to someone on their birthday as a present, as like a wish for, for long life. There she is with them, peaches again, peaches of immortality. And we can see a bottle in there too. I'm not sure if that's the elixir of immortality or longevity, but probably is. And again, the beautiful sailing across the sea from Peng Lai, the magical island sailing to China. And then the, uh, the next image, the next image is from a beam inside the summer palace. So this is painted on, you know how on like walls and stuff, you can have a little penellation on the, on the edge. It's painted on one of those. And this is also Magu presenting longevity wishes. She's got her peaches again, the hemp maiden, and they're playing Go, I believe. And the next slide shows you an image of the, of, of the summer palace. So the summer palace is huge. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's in Beijing. It's gigantic, and it's actually in part modeled on the supposed layout of that mythical island, Peng Lai. So when emperors would go on vacation for the summer, they would have this amazing palace kind of shaped like what we might call like Atlantis or something if it was associated with the, the Garden of, of Youth or the, the um, a Garden of Delight and the Fountain of Youth. And then the last picture I have is also of the summer palace. This is of, um, of the Wenchang, Wenchang Pavilion, which is one of the many, many places you can visit, but I thought it would be nice to end on something modern that you can visit today. And this is from the Qing Dynasty, which is the last dynasty. So 
uh, yeah, the last dynasty of Imperial China that was overthrown by the KMD in 1912, I believe, but you may have seen that really great movie, um, The Last Emperor. It's like really, really like won a bunch of Oscars back in the day, The Last Emperor. And it's got like, a little child king and he's like trying to learn how to wear glasses. That emperor is Qing Dynasty. So that's the last. That takes place in 1912. So yeah, do I get to yeah, do this dab I, now? <laughs> I, I was going to say you've earned the dab. Uh, <laughs> I think every every nobody waited for you for that dab. I think a lot of people have been dabbing. Uh... <laughs> Tara, have you already hit your dab? Have I what? No, I'm talking to someone in the chat. Oh, nice. Oh, yes. Thanks for, thank you everyone on the live who has just watched me verbal about this stuff that I love. Um, honestly, I'm so used to teaching art classes or doing stuff to do with cannabis. And this is like pretty much the first time where they've been so connected for me in, in content. Uh, so, really so, so someone wants you to hold up your dab rig and can we give a shout out to the company? <laughs> absolutely, oh my gosh, absolutely. So this is a stash Rio. So it's a cold start, right? I'm a cold start queen, I yeah. always do cold start. But you can do a torch dab, you can do an other type of dab with this too. Um, although I haven't tried it with a spinner cap. Um, but it's cool, it's quartz, by the way. But it's a torch, a silicone sleeve, and <clears throat> and a glass bit. And it's like all one handy thing. And it's just helpful because I'm always forgetting shit. And so it's like nice to have everything in one place. Um, and it's made by uh, Stash Rio. I'm gonna I'm gonna type it in the chat because it's for the spelling. Stash Stash Rio. Yeah, it's does, everyone, does anyone remember the Diamond Rio, the uh, very first MP3 player? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 just a baby. But uh, oh, <laughs> oh, stash. All right, sorry, I I, I was close. <laughs> yeah, we we should bring uh we should bring him on. That would be and cool. Just, yeah. Just redo your 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 conversation from a couple months ago. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted I wanted to mention if you're interested in this fabric, by the way, peeps. Um, look, there are a lot of portable fabric companies that just slap their sticker on the same device from China, like, and it's all the same device. We know this. If you're a dabber, you know this because you probably bought one and it's probably broken on you. The Stash Rio is not like that. Okay, I have a Puffco. I have all these devices that have broken. <laughs> this is my legit favorite because it's just flame and glass and no electronics so it's easier to clean and it's like two hundred dollars cheaper too so <laughs> and, and what's in there right now i think this is chem dog <laughs> chem dog <laughs> <laughs> that's hard on lungs <laughs> yeah different strokes for different folks right did you see that Far Forbes article that was all like hating on dabs? And I was like, man, don't be such a hater. <laughs> Diamond Rio made buses and trucks. I didn't know that. So what other, all right. So is this kind of the rig you're hitting all the time? Like yes. what other, uh, okay. So, yeah. so the, the Puffco is gathering dust on the shelf right now. The Puffco and the four broken atomizers are all gathering dust. Yes. I um I don't know. I feel like the only advantages it has is that it fits in a cup holder. <laughs> but this comes with plugs and a case for travel. Um and I just I don't know. I appreciate stoners who understand that it's like all about the plant and who have a mind towards care too. Like when an engineer cares about like people taking care of themselves it just means that the device will be better for them i don't know i think rod knows a lot of people who who are medical patients so he doesn't want to oppress them with gigantic margins it's interesting i mean you were talking about kind of the product made in china and slapped with the logo on i mean what, what i've seen recently it's funny at you know the big cannabis trade shows when so historically a chinese you know U.S. brand will 
have their product made in China and sell it into the US market. And now all those Chinese factories are like, fuck that, we'll just create our own brand <laughs> and mm -hmm. make the same shit and sell it. Uh, like Mar I think Mars Hydro is kind of an example of that with lights. But uh, at the trade shows, you'd see all these booths popping up of kind of the Chinese company making weed gear <laughs> and it's a bunch of like really awkward, like non weed smoking Chinese people, you know, like, like they'd send their junior team, like the 22, 23, 24 year olds to the events. And it's like, have you ever smoked weed? They're like, no, of course <laughs> but not. they're, 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 so they're selling trouble. like, yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's great though. The like names you see where it's like oil experience heating device. <laughs> and it's like, what could that be for? <laughs> yeah, and no, I lived in France for a couple of years, and I remember, uh, you know, people would have T-shirts with English writing on it, and you'd kind of read it, and you'd be like, that makes no sense. But they're, like, psyched to have the English writing on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, language, it's, it's funny. When, lang when a language is not your own, it does have the potential to become decorative. Like, I've seen some bad Chinese tattoos uh, since moving to the U.S. I once saw a guy, I saw him at the zoo, actually. I don't know why I remember that it was at the zoo, but he had the Chinese word for and <laughs> tattooed on him. <laughs> like, just as well. <laughs> right. Like, are you all going to line up? And, ooh, with a, like, I was wondering if he had friends that each on their bicep had a different character and they'd, like, line up and make a sentence, like, at a sporting match or something. But, woof. <laughs> Then again, I love Chinglish things too. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the- uh... Cannabis industries for a stable economy. I mean, I mean, John, I don't think anybody's gonna, gonna disagree with you that cannabis is good for local economy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, we know about go. that tax. <laughs> So you're going to come back soon, not as our art correspondent, but as our dab correspondent. And we'll bring on, uh, who, who are you thinking as the uh, first uh, brand we want to get to know? Oh my gosh. Well, where to begin? There's so many danks out there. I feel like I could learn so much from anyone from 710 Labs all the way to a home grower who understands what they're doing. So it's just like, there's there's such a diverse um, community to, to draw from. I feel like I definitely have a lot of favorites and I'm gonna ping them all <laughs> and see see who's down. But Well, so yeah. who are some of your favorite? I mean, I'll, I'll, I can get in touch with the 710 Labs guys. And uh, and so, I mean, yeah, we, we could go kind of like, I love, you know, I, I used to organize these things in LA with kind of local, I mean, pre-coronavirus, but with local hash makers who were all, you know, either sourcing weed or growing in their backyard and then, you know, making their traditional market branding uh, or putting their branding on a product that, you know, and they'd sell to their friends and their friends of friends and uh, could bring some of those guys on and talk shop. Yeah. Or also this is related to, this is not, dabs but i just really love them and that's why i'm wearing all their jewelry today gotta give a shout out to ross boss who um take like nugs or cannabis leaves that mean something important to you like say a nug from like your wedding day and dip it in 24 karat gold and then set it with an ethically sourced gemstone so this one has a red sapphire in it um and this is also what they do this one has amethyst they basically make amazing luxury ethical weed jewelry that is a great way to commemorate an important time in your life, but also Snoop wears it on stage <laughs> and so does Cardi B. And they're based, and it's, it's a couple with a very cute dog <laughs> based in Northern California. And I just, they might let, be someone let, else. Let, let's bring them on. What, what's, what are their names? What's the brand? I'll, I'll reach out to them for sure. Their names are Ross Boss. I'll type it in. R-A-S. Um, R-A-S boss. And by the way, they put the strain name on the back. So this, for example, is oh, yeah, sour yeah, cannabis tea. jewelry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And set with a set with an opal. 
I met them at Chalice 2017. Does anyone remember Chalice? Yes, and actually, I was going to bring Doug on because uh, there was a big. Uh, so, so for everybody watching, um, this guy uh, who's a Politico writer. Just, so I, I, I've kind of poked fun at High Times uh, and Med Men pretty incessantly, and uh, and this guy wrote an article about how kind of the current finance douchebags who run High Times bungled that i mean hi they basically you know tried to co-opt can what high times was which was like authentic cannabis culture and then put like their you know corporate finance you know spin on it but try to still pretend like they're part of the culture and uh this guy wrote an actually let me put it in the chat but this guy wrote an article uh yesterday and I just reached out to him and I want to see if he wants to come on and, and basically bring like a bunch of the people who were there in the eighties and nineties um, on with them to have a conversation. I, I had talked to uh, Stormy Simon, who was the CEO of high times for like three months at the beginning of this year about coming on to talk. And she was like, fuck yeah. So uh, we could bring her on and, a bunch of the people who were there <laughs> and Doug who got fucked by high times, uh, with the chalice, uh, festival. Um, I heard it was a problem with, um, basically we have to put down a big deposit when you book musicians. I heard it was a problem with like something to do with the, the, the musical acts having really big deposits or something, but that's just what I heard like at a party, <laughs> you know, I have no idea how substantiated that was, but yeah. Chalice 2017. Okay, so, so this is the, I'm putting the Politico article in. So I, I'm going to give people homework now, uh, which is prepping for conversations. So this, this will be the high times conversation, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But uh, Wednesday night, we have um, Dan Grace from Darkheart. Uh, Nat Pennington from Humboldt Seed Company and Dale Hunt, who's a uh, plant biologist and uh, patent attorney uh, to talk about. Uh, so <clears throat> Freak Show, which um, <laughs> someone's Michelle P. Loving our So basically, actually, this, this is Gemma too. So my shirt is uh, when Gemma was two. She, Aww, she nice. This, and I was like, what is that? And it's a cow with memes. Do you know what memes are? In Nips? Chinese? Yeah, nipples. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's half Chinese. So, so basically, my when she was two, she drew this. And I was like, I, I thought it was a centipede, maybe. And it was a cow <laughs> with a whole lot of nipples. So uh, if everyone can see that, that's a, a Gemma original imagine the stimulation that cow is capable of experiencing <laughs> yes it's it's people, really <laughs> are you jealous <laughs> um, so so basically uh, so wednesday night so so freak show which is this uh th there are all these like old school breeders who you know uh like last week um we did something with uh doc ray who you know is a vietnam or end of vietnam into the early 80s vet um and he's been living off grid in humboldt for the past you know 30 something years and you know he he's been breeding and has truly unique stuff and uh you know, sees just this market exploding and, and you have all these small, amazing breeders who don't really know how to protect themselves. And, uh, you know, whether they want to be offensive or defensive and not have someone else swoop in and, and steal their genetics and then say that they created something. And, um, so anyway, we're going to have a conversation yeah. Wednesday night about kind of how does a small craft legacy breeder, um, enter kind of the modern weed market, uh, like, you know, 
specifically in California, but then obviously globally, because you can sell seeds. Uh, we need Father Kevin Drudgery to preach the sermon at least. Yeah, well, Kevin, so Kevin, we're doing a, a weekly Kevin show, but right now he's at like peak season and he had bulls uh his neighbor's bulls got into his property and oh, literally um, bulls yeah two bulls were <laughs> the neighbor's two bulls were fighting all over his farm and uh while kevin sat there watching i mean i don't know how much bulls weigh like two thousand pounds each but um anyway Ke Evan's currently dealing with 120 degree weather up in Humboldt on the hill, but uh, he, he's coming on as much as he can. Uh, you know, we, we were doing a weekly show, but I'm cognizant that uh, he has some weed to grow and he's basically up on the hill all day, every day. Uh, and so when he comes home, I don't want to be like, the people need you. Uh, so he, he needs some time up, but, but he'll, he'll, he'll regularly, like he was part of the auction on Friday night. Um, and he actually auctioned off two cuts. Uh, and I think shredder, uh, who's on here right now is the winner of some Kevin genetics, but, uh, anyway. Um, all right. So, so you're smoke, you're smoking, uh, what was the brand that one? The, this one is plain Jane. Okay. And do you know the people behind it? Do you like it? Uh, not at all, but they were recommended to me by a friend. Okay. Completely out of the blue. I was interested in them because I heard that they- Wait, sorry, hold, hold, hold that back up. Did that say hi? Ah, got it. Okay, so uh, how is that? So, so it's, 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 a, it's a hemp joint. I've never been into smoking CBD flower until lockdown. <laughs> Before, I've never even like, I've done like one CBD dab, but I was always a THC, give me the globby, the glob on the diamond kind of girl. And then in lockdown, I'm starting to see the point of consuming an enormous amount of CBD all the time in all the ways. And this is one of them. And so I also find it to be a good counterbalance. Yeah. Um, so, so, so it like, if you get too high and you smoke that, it'll like bring you back into balance. Yeah. But it's also, um, to be honest, there's something of an oral fixation with me too. Before I discovered dabbing, I used to smoke an ungodly amount of flour every day and it completely instilled like a joint smoking oral fixation thing with me. Right. And I love, I can just dab diamonds now and then kind of keep my hands busy with this. <laughs> I don't know if any other, does anyone else feel the same way about smoking flour that the ritual is strangely comforting? I don't know. Yes. It's like... Yeah, no, I mean like grinding it up. Yeah, yeah, So, but how, how does it smoke? Very tastily. And I think the difference okay. is that the difference between this and some of the other flour that I've, not even the other hemp flour, just the other flour that I've tried before in pre-roll form is that the packaging that this came in was actually airtight. <laughs> Whereas a lot of the other pre-roll stuff that I've been given, THC or CBD heavy flour has been not quite like closed as much or, or not that the packaging was intentionally janky, but it was just like maybe still had some more evolutions to go before it would be sealed and keep all the terpenes in there. You don't want that stuff to oxidize, you know? Yeah, no, I, I think the modern uh, retail market is every grower's nightmare where like the presentation of your product is in its worst form, which is like a lonely eighth nug in a jar <laughs> or like a pre, you know, even worse, a pre-roll, right? Like, where it's already ground up. No, no, no one who grows stores their shit as like a single eighth in a jar or even worse, a pre-roll. So, um. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it just gives the taste too much time to change, but I don't know. Do you prefer cured resin or live resin? Cause I just feel like different people like a different amount of juiciness. I mean, but well, you're talking for concentrates. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious. 
I would say more light. I mean, I, 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 I'm more a, a flower smoker. Um, but obviously I appreciate my, my Ros uh, I, and I'm more, when I smoke concentrates, it's more kind of uh, solventless extraction. Um, mm. Oh, like, oh, oh, you know what brand is next level? As, and not, and I don't mean the brand next level. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean the adjective. <laughs> I was just listening to your description and just think and like drooling to myself. Their emblem is a blue lotus. They're Northern California. They have Flan. Oh my gosh, what's her name? Blue River? Is it Blue River? There's Blue oh, River Terps. Yes. Yeah, I talked right. to uh, to him. They're just hold, delicious. Hold Rhode Island's in the house. Where's where did I just see Rhode Island in the house? I swear I just saw someone say Rhode Island. I love I Rhode am. Island. I, I am my first grow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so yeah so you went to college in Ma so i grew up in in massachusetts and uh every summer i'd go down to rhode island and my parents are there right now my brother and his wife who have a um they have this amazing yogurt company called white mustache and so they have a factory in brooklyn and then they have a factory or they they have a kitchen uh in the um in the Italy in la and so basically the, e nice. the owners of the owners of Italy love their yogurt so much that uh, when they opened the LA Italy, they said, we'll give you free kitchen space to make as much yogurt as you can. And we'll sell it all day long up in the grocery store and, and, and all the chefs at Italy use it. Um, but there, so my brother and his wife just bought a place in Rhode Island, right on the water, like tons of land. Um, so anyway, when I saw that someone was from, anytime I see Boston and Rhode Island, <laughs> I'm very happy being in LA. <laughs> They're so different. I kind of miss, um, I've been watching uh, Lovecraft Country and I've kind of been nostalgic for New England when I, when I used to live there. It's, uh, I miss the fall. Every every fall, you gotta miss the East Coast and the way the leaves change. Oh yeah, no, I mean my my kid, I mean Gemma's five now, and the concept of winter, spring, summer, and fall is so foreign to her because there's no there's no indication that things are different in LA. It's, it's like seventy two and sunny or ninety two and sunny all year long, and uh, there's no like you know there's no leaf peeping season uh or anything like that but yeah um, la is a so, weird right. yeah so so all right so we're gonna uh in the next week or two raise your hand if you want to see mia uh with some amazing concentrate brands <laughs> and we'll we'll pick one and go live yes, with them. I think I'd like when I last checked, we had like two, we had like two hundred and fifty people watching. Uh, and let me see how many people are actually go back to YouTube. But yeah, I think that would be yeah. um, a lot of fun. Yeah, we have two two hundred and sixty people watching right now. So and, and so the other thing, uh, oh, and sit, city soul shine growing. I, I saw your comment earlier about patents. I I think for me, you know, I'm trying to think of how to say it. When I first moved to LA as a Boston driver. Uh, driving around LA was amazing because everybody is so polite and like, no snow. you know, let, let, yeah, well, there's no, and they're terrible drivers too. Like as soon as it starts raining, everybody slows down to like 30 miles an hour. Um, but the, the one thing I noticed was you're driving on the highway and there's an X, you know, there's an off ramp and the off ramp is a mile away and there's a line of cars patiently in the right lane waiting to get off and i would always be like 
fuck that, like blow by everybody, cut in the last minute and be kind of the East Coast driver. Um, and, and I feel like with plant patents, it's, it's kind of similar where the cannabis industry is basically onboarding to a, 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 whether you like it or not, a, an agricultural plant patent market. I mean, tomatoes, grapes, uh, uh, corn, I mean, you have Monsanto. So for me, with a lot of the patent stuff, it is about just kind of playing defense rather than offense. I don't think a lot of the people that I see who are like these small cultivators are necessarily thinking that they want to make billions of dollars. They just don't want someone to fuck them over. Um, and it's kind of like, how do they do this? And, and, you know, filing provisional patents and patents, um, you know, it costs money, but I, I, I can't tell this guy's or who it is, but I mean, I, I, I know someone whose own son, uh, stole his genetics and, uh, brought them to market and they're no longer on speaking terms. So this is a father and a son. Um, so anyway, it, it, it's, it's a rough and, 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 and you, and you're a small breeder working in a, in a world where you have all these douchey people coming into the weed world. And, um, yeah, I mean, communes, not corporations true, but, but it's a corporate world that cannabis is becoming. So it, it's basically, how do you protect yourself? Um, and again, it's not always being offensive uh, and thinking that you want to go out and sue anybody. Uh, sometimes it's, it's playing defense and just not wanting to get your shit that like, you know, a lot of these people are guarding their stuff. So how do they feel comfortable sharing it? Um, without knowing that someone else is going to like, I'm, I'm hopefully going to do something with Mojave Richmond in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I forget what we called it. Uh, but like the, the name change game, like taking something and just calling it something different and, uh, and calling it your own. Um, and I can't remember why I got off on that tangent, but, uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, Wednesday, we'll be talking, uh, kind of how small breeders with something unique, uh, can bring their genetics. You know what to the time on Wednesday? What's that? Do you know what time on Wednesday? Uh, that's going to be eight at night. Nice. Nice. So if you want to come yeah, join us. Company? Yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> so I'm going anyway, live on Wednesday on Instagram anyway, so I might feel like gotta support this small batch person it's such a fascinating topic too yeah i mean th think of all the very small people who have been growing weed for decades who have unique stuff i mean uh i don't know if steve uh is watching but i have a guy uh in illinois who sent me a lot of his library, which is all this stuff, um, that I'm going to start popping next season. And he thinks he has a lot of really special stuff and, uh, there's only one way to find out. Um, and, uh, he doesn't want it to get lost. And so anyway, uh, with that, why don't we, Oh, so, so the other thing I was going to talk about is, you know, we we do some shows that are like legendary OG breeders and cultivators, other ones which are, you know, going down the health and wellness track. And this is got doctors <laughs> on too. A, a deep dive in our history. And, and people give me shit. They're like, this sucks. What is this? And it's like, if you watch any network like take ABC as an example, like on a Tuesday at 8 a.m. It's like the morning talk show live from New York. Like at 8 p.m. It's the sitcom. Uh, it could be a sitcom you like. It could be a sitcom you don't like. On Saturday, it could be candle pins or some other like, you know, bull riding or PGA golf or, or 
it could be like the NBA finals, right? Um, and everybody is into different things. So for me, when people bitch about stuff, I'm kind of like, well, I put in the title what we're talking about. So if that's not for you, just fucking skip it. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I like to go in all different directions. Uh, I, I like my deep dives into 5,000 year old, uh, Chinese history. Uh, and the connection is, is the hemp goddess. Um, if you don't like it, just come back the next time when it's something you do like. So well, I find thinking about history very comforting these days, even if you aren't a stoner because it's like oh yes history's lasted a long time it'll put current times in perspective <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Shred shredder likes his bull riding yeah his paps paps i i would always get sad on the weekends when like you know a i'm not a bit i'm not a big college football fan unless it's like the end of the season or like college basketball in in like january um so it's like you, you go and it's like on <laughs> sugar. Jesus. Ah, uh, these people. Um, <laughs> but anyway, there there there's, you know, some people are passionate about bull riding and uh candle pins and uh college softball and uh all sorts of other things. I mean, so. cannabis is like the great cultural unifier. I've met more different types of people through being in the weed scene than I have in any other subculture I've participated in. I've worked in fashion. I've been a goth. I've done other things. And I feel like <clears throat> of all the things I'm into, cannabis has united me with the most varied types of people. And that's one of its strengths that it can offer something to just about anyone. You know, so, so you how long ago did you exit your goth phase? I'm still in it. So okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, shout out if you're looking to support an LGBTQ owned goth brand uh, based out of uh, downtown Los Angeles, look up Fox Blood Shop. Most of their stuff has pockets, which is helpful. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been I've been um, been also talking to the ladies there about like CBD use and they're they're very much part of. Uh, I don't know. They are very much part of the like independent spirit that we like to support in cannabis too. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we will uh, kill the live stream. I got to get dinner ready. Uh, Mia, thank you so much for doing two weeks of homework and <laughs> research to, to give this presentation. I hope everybody appreciates it. Oh my gosh. That. Thank you for having uh, me. So thank you for having me, and thank you for hanging so, out and nerding so, out. With so, so, so I want, so I want Mia to be a, like a a regular show host. So can can we give her some love <laughs> and cheer I'm, her on? I'm okay with earning the love. <laughs> and we'll 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 go from obscure topics to right down the middle. Uh, Dab, dab review uh, conversations. We'll get down to the real technical stuff, all the way to marketing stuff, <laughs> to all right. the way to growing stuff, because there's everything in weed, everything. All right, everybody, have a good uh, for all of you in the U.S. I guess today's I didn't even realize it was Labor Day when I was like, let's do it on Monday. But uh, but neither did I. I just kind of work every day. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just, I, I've been working. I, I, I've actually been reconciling the uh, auction uh, winners and, oh God, I, I, my head's mush from dealing with all the auction stuff. Uh, anybody who won, be patient. I'm, I'm still trying to match YouTube usernames with real names with whether the payments were made and where your shipping address is and all that stuff. But uh, we, we raised, uh, I think over ten thousand dollars this weekend so you can all give yourselves a pat on the back and um in the future we will have more uh economical items to win and bid on uh because i understand that uh not everybody has a thousand bucks to spend on some seeds so with that i'm going to kill the live stream <laughs> and we'll See you Wednesday, if not before then, uh, if we sneak something in on Tuesday. And 
Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.